Do you like to make your SQL Server high availability setup on AWS much easier to maintain and a lot more cost effective? Then watch this deep dive on how to do it with FSX for Windows File Server. Hello, my name is Daniel Kreuzhofer. I'm a specialist solutions architect for Microsoft workloads on AWS. Let's have a look at the agenda. We'll start with a brief overview of what FSX for Windows File Server is. Then we'll have a look on how customers are usually running SQL Server high availability setups on AWS and how FSX can simplify those. Then I'll show you a demo of a SQL Server high availability setup using FSX for Windows and how simple it is to set up a sample environment. So what is Amazon FSX for Windows File Server? In its core, it's a fully managed Windows file system. That means you get native Windows servers that provide a Windows file system to your applications. At the same time, FSX for Windows is deeply integrated in the AWS platform and can be configured through the AWS console and also through AWS APIs. And because it's running native Windows servers underneath, it's fully compatible with the Windows file system and also can be joined to existing customer Active Directories or the AWS Managed Active Directory service. You can run it in a multi-AZ setup for high availability, and there are different options to optimize each FSX instance for cost, be it using by HDD storage or SSD storage. That depends on the use case and your performance requirements, of course. Coming back to the topic of how customers run their SQL Server workloads in AWS. First, there is two general ways to do this. Customers can use Amazon RDS, which is a managed solution that already supports high performance and high availability scenarios. But there's also customers who require a lot more control over their SQL Server setups and configuration, and that's why those customers run SQL Server self-managed on Amazon EC2. And that's the scenarios we're going to focus on right now. So how does a typical high availability scenario for SQL Server on Amazon EC2 look like? Normally, you run at least two DB instances where one is the primary server, which has its copy of the database on an EBS volume, and that instance is shipping all the changes through different mechanisms to the secondary server or multiple secondary servers. And these setups are called always on availability groups. The nature of these setups is that they will have a separate copy of the database on each individual server. And there's also another server running in a separate AZ as the witness. But there is also a setup that is called failover clustering instances. What's different here? You still have primary and secondary servers, but this time the database copy just exists once on a shared FSX for Windows file system. The witness is another FSX for Windows running in the third availability zone, so no additional EC2 instance is required as well. And that's where FSX for Windows File Server makes the setup much simpler because you don't have to set up and maintain that highly available shared file system. There's also other aspects to consider why a failover clustering setup might be better than using availability groups. One major difference is that failover clustering doesn't require a SQL Server Enterprise license and instead can use standard licensing. And that, of course, reduces the TCO a lot. The failover clustering setup is also very familiar and a common scenario for running SQL on-premises, so you can leverage that knowledge. It's also faster because the replication is handled by the storage system and not by the SQL Server instance itself, so this frees up resources on the database server. And it's simple to set up, so database administrators will require less effort to ensure high availability setups. Now it's time to show you this failover clustering scenario in the real world. This demo is based on a blog post that was published on the AWS website by my colleagues Dudu Twizer, Bresh Bengali, and Eleven Vitier. We've put the link to the blog post in the description box of this video for your reference. So we'll start right into the architecture diagram of the blog post and how to get started. This infrastructure is used in the blog post and also for this demo. Now the question is, how do you set it up? Well, you can do this step-by-step -step manually in the console or from the AWS command line interface, but we've created a quick start in the form of a CDK project, a cloud development kit project, that will do the deployment of this basic infrastructure. The link to that project is in the description box of this video as well. 
So if you never used CDK before, you should watch our introduction to CDK, also linked in the description, but I would recommend doing that later once you like to implement this on your own. So let's have a brief look at the CDK project and how to use it. The CDK project has multiple stacks that represent the architecture for the demo environment. Starting with the VPC stack and DHCP options for Active Directory. Then the Managed Active Directory and the Secret Manager that will hold our administrator password so we can log into our machines later. The FSX for Windows stack, a Bastion host stack, we will use this machine to log into the VPC and from there we will connect to the other machines in the environment. And finally, the SQL Server EC2 instances in another CDK stack. To run this deployment, the only thing to do is to change these parameters to your AWS account number and the AWS region to deploy to. You also need to name a key pair in your account for that region that you have access to. Everything else can be left as it is unless you like to change things like the performance of the FSX or the size of the SQL Server instances, for example. This can be done here very easily. To deploy this infrastructure into the account, you only have to run the CDK deploy command and wait for it to finish. The double minus all parameter is used to deploy all stacks in the project in sequence, so you don't have to run it multiple times for each individual stack. This can take about two hours to finish, so we will not wait for it. Instead, let's have a look at the final result in the AWS console. Once the deployment is complete, you should have a list of CloudFormation stacks in your AWS account that looks similar to this. Looking at the EC2 console, you will see that there is now three instances running. As defined, there are two SQL nodes and one Bastion host. Referring back to the blog post, using the CDK template, we've just taken the shortcut to about the middle of the document, where the next step is to create the SQL Server file share on the newly created FSX file system. To start working on that, I will log on to the Bastion host, but to do that, I need the administrator password for the domain admin. Where do we get that? It's stored in AWS Secrets Manager because the CDK template stored that password in Secrets Manager so it's safe and we can fetch it from there. Here we go. I retrieved the secret value. This is the user ID and the managed ID, the name of the domain and the password. Now I can log into the Bastion host by clicking on the instance ID, then on connect and then I can download the RDP file. This makes it easier. The only thing left is to enter the correct credentials that we just got from Secrets Manager. On the machine, I double check in the Active Directory Users and Computers console that all required machines are part of the Active Directory. This looks correct. I've also created one service account for the SQL Server instances and a group DB admins that I added that service user to and also my personal admin user. I also created a second group, SQL Servers, which has as members the two SQL Server computer objects. Next, according to the blog post, I've mounted the D drive of the FSX so I can create my SQL Server share. To be able to mount the FSX, I added all three computers, the Bastion host, the SQL node 1 and the SQL node 2, to the default security group of the VPC because otherwise they cannot reach the FSX. I did this for convenience. You can of course define more fine-grade network access control, but for the sake of the demo, this is good enough. So let's create the SQL DB folder on that drive. Next, we use the PowerShell template provided in the blog post to create the FSX share for SQL. The main things to note are that you need to change the FSX parameter to the DNS name of your FSX Windows Remote PowerShell endpoint. You will find that DNS name here in the FSX console. Also double check that the user and group names provided to grant access are the ones that you created in the Active Directory. The special flag needed for the SQL high availability mode of the share is the continuously available flag. So let's execute that command. It should now create our FSX share. That was successful. The next step is we set permissions to the share on the file level. For that, I will add the DB admins, the SQL servers, and the SQL service account to the security list and give full control to all three objects. Okay, now we have created the file share and we are ready to install SQL Server in failover clustering mode. 
This part is probably well known to anyone who has already installed a SQL Server failover cluster on premises. However, to do this in AWS, our SQL Server machines need more IP addresses. By default, each instance only has one IP address assigned, but we need three IP addresses per SQL Server. One for the host, one for the SQL cluster, and one for the client endpoint. We're adding those through the networking managed IP addresses action. Here we add two more addresses, preferably ones we can easily remember. So in this case, I will add 1010 to 100 and 1010 to 101. The same happened for the second SQL Server. So here I now have also three IP addresses. Next, if we start the SQL Server setup on the first SQL Server instance, we see that the option to do a new SQL Server failover cluster installation is currently grayed out, so we need to create a failover cluster first. This is done through the failover cluster manager in Windows. In the failover cluster manager, we create a new cluster with the create cluster wizard. Adding both computers to the list of servers is the first step. Next, we create a name for the cluster endpoint. And next, we need to uncheck the add all eligible storage to the cluster because we will point the cluster to FSX instead of using local storage. After the wizard is done, we need to set the static IP addresses to the cluster endpoint instead of using DHCP. So I'm double clicking the endpoint resource and then the first IP address. Confirm to set a static IP address and in our case we use the static IP address ending with 101 for both servers in the different subnets. After applying the changes, the cluster should show an online status. Now I need to make sure that each of the IP addresses of the cluster is only active on the node that also has this static IP assigned. So the 10.10.2.101 should only be active on SQL node 1, and the 10.10.3.101 should only be active on SQL node 2. After applying that change and some delay to apply the changes, all nodes and cluster networks should be up. In the Active Directory Users and Groups, we now need to add the new cluster endpoint object to the SQL Servers group to make sure the cluster has the necessary rights. We also need to make sure that our cluster endpoint object is allowed to create and delete computer objects in Active Directory. For that, I right click on Computers, then Delegate Control. Then I select the cluster endpoint and I have to filter for computers so it does find it. Then I select a custom task to delegate. Select only computer objects and to allow to create and delete selected objects. And then I select full control for permissions. And we're done with the permission settings. Now if we start the SQL Server setup again on our first node, it will show us the option to create a SQL Server failover cluster. Let's do this for the first node. In a feature selection, choose at least the database engine services. In the instance configuration, we define a unique network name for our SQL cluster. In the cluster network configuration, I select to configure a static IP address for the listener on this machine, so I identify first the correct subnet, which is also shown here on the desktop, and I set 1010 to 100 as the listener IP because I used the 101 for the cluster IP. For the second server, this will be done for the other subnet, also using the IP 100 for the listener IP. For the service accounts, I use the user I created in Active Directory for running the agent and database engine. Now in the database engine configuration, I go to data directories and define the data root directory to be our newly created FSX share SQL DB. Note that compared to always on availability groups, the user data, log and backup will be all on the shared directory. We could define a different directory for the tempdb. This would make sense for instance types with NVMe high speed local storage and would get us better performance, but for the sake of the demo, we leave it on the FSX as well. Finally, I will add my current user as a database admin, otherwise I cannot continue and then I can finalize the installation. Everything will install now for the first database server. 
Let's check now in the failover cluster manager that this node is up and running. In the roles list, we see that the role is running. And if we open the cluster, we see one node is up and running. Now let's bring up the second node on the cluster. We're logged in to the second node. And this time, instead of running a new SQL Server failover cluster installation, we choose to add a node to a SQL Server failover cluster. This is going to be easier because most settings will be taken from the existing cluster node and only a few changes will be made. So most dialogues can be clicked through with next. For this node, we add the 10.10.3.100 static IP address. In the service accounts tab, we only need to give the SQL admin password again and click next. Finally, we're ready to add the node and click install. Once it's done, we need to make sure in the failover cluster manager that for each node in the cluster, the IP address is set to static, which is correct for the first node, and also the advanced policies, only the owner node of the static IP is selected. Same on the second node, IP address is set to static, and only the owner machine of the static IP is selected as possible owner. In the list of nodes, one IP is online and one is offline, which is the expected state because the secondary will become online only if the primary node fails. Now we have configured the SQL Server failover cluster correctly, so it's using FSX for the shared storage. For more information, please refer to the links in the description of this video. Thank you for watching. Bye.